Chairing this session will be Mr. Ritesh Mehta, Head West, North and East, Residential Advisory Services, JLL. Mr. Ritesh overlooks all aspects of business, including primary, luxury sales, exclusive mandates, leasing, digital marketing and corporate divestment. He has rich experience of over 18 years in the field of residential advisory services and extensive experience at reputable firms like JLL, CBRE and Square Yards as well. I'll be introducing our speakers now. Uh, we have uh, with us today Dr. Advocate Harshul Savla, Managing Partner at M Realty. Uh, Mr. Harshul Savla is a real estate developer and an author as well. He's a Managing Partner of M Realty Suvidha Life Spaces, which has completed 2 million square feet of, re of development across Mumbai city in the last 30 years. He's an associate professor and a PhD guide supervisor. Dr. Herschel is the chairman of statistics and research at Credi India and at Credi MCHI as well. He's also the chairman of business process automation at Credi National Youth Wing. We also have with us today Mr. Neela Nagar, senior associate architect, architect Hafiz contractor, Mr. Neelab Nagar is an urbanist and architect with more than two decades of experience. Mr. Neelab has had a keen interest in building technology and use of innovative materials as well as energy conservation in architecture as well. Mr. Neelab joined architect Hafiz contractor in 1991 and some of his notable projects are Noida City Center, Hiranandani Office Park, ONGC Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata IGI Terminal 1B, New Delhi, Turbe Railway Station to name a few. We also have with us today Mr. Ram Raheja, who is the Managing Director at S. Raheja Realty. He's a third generation developer from a family bringing a modernized approach to the projects. He has pursued architecture at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and under his leadership, S. Raheja Realty is focusing on luxury residential and commercial development in Mumbai and has ventured into affordable housing in many metros and second tier cities as well. We also have with us today Mr. Sunil Ramani, Managing Partner of KK Ramani and Co with us today. He has over 20 year, uh, he has over 30 years, I beg your pardon, experience and has been practicing laws relating to all aspects of direct and indirect taxation, property law, income tax, GST and in various industries like construction, hotel and automobiles. His practice area also includes transfer pricing and international taxation. He is a co-author of several books including Redevelopment of Housing Societies, Deemed Conveyance under the Maharashtra Ownership Flats Act 1963, Doing Business in India, NRI Guide and FEMA Manual. Please give it up for him as well. Can I request all of you to kindly give it up loudly for our honorable speakers and moderator over here. When I say loudly, I did not actually get the loud vibe over here. Can I request all of you at the back to show some participation and clap and appreciate. Thank you. Uh, warm welcome to all the delegates here. Our to topic for today is uh, strategies for the effective redevelopment. And with me, I have all the experts who are experienced in this field. And they are quite, they have varied experience on redevelopment. So my first question, I mean, it's a very layman kind of a conversation when it comes to redevelopment. Uh, every nook, corner, every lane, every part of the city today is uh, having redevelopment projects. So it's quite interesting to know both the sides, the challenges, the success, the failure, uh, what is there on the demand side, what is there on the supply side. It's very important for us to understand. So the next 30 minutes or 45 minutes, we would be discussing the challenges. Also, we would be discussing the road ahead for redevelopment. So with that, my first question starts with Mr. Raheja. Uh, if you can provide an overview of redevelopment projects, including its objectives and vision in coming future. So first of all, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, it'll be a very interesting session with a complete diverse uh, set of people towards uh, the redevelopment uh, uh, discussion, so to say. Um, Coming to uh, your question as an introductory to what redevelopment is, um, it's good to start off with that, but honestly, I think everybody knows it way too well in Mumbai. Um, having said that, uh, redevelopment is a very, very unique um, business model that actually, the actual inception is Mumbai. MMR is the true inception of redevelopment. If you go to any international city in the world, the concept of the business doesn't exist. So. Uh, 
with great pride we can all say that yes this is a innovative business model that has actually been created by mmr developers um and all thanks to the concept of fsi um and ownership where the uh, government at every given uh, certain number of years has changed the rules of fsi um so when i say that i'm going to go little uh, into a history and basic a uh, concept a building which was built post independence in the 1960s uh, so to say uh, some of them that we've recently just demolished and rebuilt those were all had fsi of 1 one is for it's simple it's one is to one for example if a plot is 10000 square feet you have 10000 square feet built on it um certain areas were given free at those points your balcony and uh, uh, maybe uh, some small parts like niche were given free at those points so one fsi is already consumed cut to 2024 we have a entirely different concept of fsi going on it's all based on road width uh, the same plot which has 10000 square feet now can have in certain schemes all the way up to 60000 square feet being built um mumbai has four three different approval authorities from mada to sra to uh, bmc each one has its different calculations of fsi um that's where all the experts come in to actually understand the detailing of which road gets what fsi under which scheme you can go the dpcr 2034 is very very extensive it will give you all the details of which plot gets which fsi and of course the road width makes a big difference um so as a developer when we go in and we give a proposal to a society um typically i'll give you example of a bmc development so if a plot is consumed 10000 we'll go there give them an offer of say additional 35% 40% that makes it approximately 1.5 fsi going to the society and then the developer has the balance 1.5 to sell in the free market that's the general concept of where redevelopment starts but not only comparing to the buildings of 1960s we have to give it uh, the credit to um, the entire uh, 2034 dpcr which this massive fsi surge has come in because plots that were even built by us and me during my career which we had built with two fsi today under schemes like 2000 under uh, 3319 we have five and a half six fsi and we ourselves are redeveloping a plot that we built 10 years ago wow that's great so that's great <laughs> because that was built under 2 fsi we have now 6 fsi to play with so why not uh so everyone's here to gain everyone stands to gain and in a dense city like mumbai which is not a typical uh, round city like majority of the metropoles of the world where one of the few cities which is a length and breadth city like uh, manhattan like mumbai where land is scarce demand is always high and uh, similarly new york has air rights we have tdr and fsi so right. just to give a little overview of where we start the session ram that's great to know the velocity and the breed development happening across mmr but do you really feel that this is restricted only to bombay in india or all other cities are also equally uh, progressing in terms of redevelopment so it's definitely catching up across uh, i know definitely in south delhi there is redevelopment going on yeah. but it's a different calculation of redevelopment over there where basically um structures which were ground 1 2 are becoming ground 1 2 3 uh, there's no tdr uh, and fsi that much but the whole dcr there is different right so the there is major scope for redevelopment across india and slowly and surely you'll find different different parts of bombay uh, pune has started i mean different parts of india i mean sorry pune has started ahmedabad there are uh, buildings which are old who want to redevelop um recently funnily a uh, lot of tier 2 cities there uh, people have randomly uh, called some of our project department saying that you know would you be interested in coming here for redevelopment so um there is a big demand but having said that the success that bombay has seen will be very very difficult and long run for those city to reach under the redevelopment space bombay is seeing the majority of redevelopment happen now because of the scarcity of land sure um yeah. for them to reach that scarcity of land will take some more time but surely it it's it's a matter of time okay okay so i think uh, that makes a statement unreal in a layman's mind that wherever there is land availability 
there is no redevelopment. It doesn't say that. I mean, basis your conversation, it looks like cities like Pune, Ahmedabad are also moving towards redevelopment, where there is ample of land available. So great to know. I mean, it's one of the streamlines for new India and new city being built up. So my second question uh, would be directly to Mr. Savla, Harshul, uh, which is one of the favorite questions which everyone would have. And it is a very common thing. We know that Bombay is crowded with a lot many redevelopment projects. So what's going to be the price in future? Is it the price is going to reduce, it's going to stabilize, or it's going to grow? And especially in the redevelopment vertical, we want to understand your views, Harshul. So, uh, you know, factually, 10 years worth of... Hello, hello. So on a factual ground, 10 years worth of redevelopment has practically happened in last 2 to 3 years. So there is no denial to that. Uh, the jump of FSI has been there. So you know right from, uh, it's almost doubled thanks to schemes like 33, 11, 10, 12B, etc. So stock has also increased. But you should note about redevelopment is, and I was doing a study uh, you know, back at Kredai, almost 40 buildings worth of stock of redevelopment is equal to 1 mil land. Wow. That's so, the spread looks larger, but if you really put it in a perspective of a mill land, it's not really that great. Second, almost one third to 40, 50 percent of the supply goes back to the old members. So, really, if you see, you count the number of buildings, but practically the supply is only half because the half is, you know, people who are coming back. With regards to pricing, I mean, there's always a question that prices will go down because the supply is coming up, you know, pure demand supply. But if you really look what has backed up this redevelopment surge, so three factors, rise of FSI, great sales post pandemic, and increase uh, and decrease in the premiums. So the government premiums that you used to pay, thanks to schemes like 3311, you are paying actually lesser. So you're getting more stock for lesser premium. Now, because of that, the surge has happened. Will the prices come down? No. I mean, for sure, purely if you look at the math, earlier it was only about location, location, location. Today it's about product, product, product. Even a Borivli market today is commanding a 40,000 rupee per square foot. So that purely states that people are not looking or favoring only one micro market. Every micro market almost, I mean, it's nearing to a situation of one Mumbai, one price. Okay. So I don't see really prices dropping down. In fact, prices are increasing in micro markets and they are almost naturalizing to one Mumbai, one price, except few premium micro markets where prices are an outlier. That's a great news. I think it's a green line. Uh, we all are happy knowing this, that the prices wouldn't fall. So coming back to the conversation, Ram, we had uh, on the first question. So the extension is, we all know that generally the perception is the redevelopment happens only with the smaller plots, with limited FSI, with limited scale of construction. So what happens on your side of the table where the developers are seeing the feasibility and what happens to the margins to the developers? So is it something that if the scale is low, the margins are low? If the scale is low, the margins are high? Is there any thumb rule uh, in redevelopment project? <clears throat> not, not really, but overall if you look at the uh, viability, um, if a certain amount of FSI is over-consumed, there isn't that much juice for us to give back to the member and thus have enough stock to, s to sell. Thus, those projects are stuck. They're not able to get good developers to actually do it right. And that's where the whole concept of self-development and all these uh, different, uh, uh, say, you know, different developers coming from different markets trying to enter the field, try, try to get a good location because otherwise they wouldn't. So that's right. where the uh, factor that a lot of projects we see that are completely unviable on the table for us personally as a group. We say, you know, this, these numbers don't work. But that's for me. There are developers who are coming from different parts of Bombay, of MMR, from outside MMR, who are saying, I'll do it. I want to make a building in Bombay. I want my logo in the skyline of Bombay. I'll do it. But he may not make the profit or the margin at the end of the project. But it be, those become like the entry point 
yeah i think ram you made a point there are a lot of developers cross city developers entering mumbai every everyone seeing the juice uh, what's been heard but actually the experience what you guys have uh, i think we'll come to that bit also when the when we talk about the challenges but in a nutshell would you agree that redevelopment projects are a high margin business not really not really not really not a high margin i think the margins uh, are low margin for the kind of time and effort we put in under behind a project to actually kick off right. margins should be much higher but the kind of money you put in upfront in a redevelopment project would be lower than a normal freehold project the acquisition of the land is taken away but our sale area is also reduced to half no got it got the rest of the cost is there the premium uh, earlier you could start projects you could sell without rera you could do all those things that a lot of developers did in fact post rera uh, we have to load everything you have to take your ccs you have to uh, put all the investments all the societies also have uh, become way smarter they don't let the developer vacate the premises until a certain amount of investment is not done until certain amount of bank guarantees are not provided absolutely yeah. so the proportion of investment is towards the amount of sale as well so if i was to buy a land my stock of sale also would go up that much of course yeah so that point you made i mean it's an excellent point where you made very clear that this day is uh, to acquire an ac acquisition also requires a lot of bank guarantees security from the members perspective yeah. which was not the case earlier so yeah. i think from that perspective the cost is going up yeah and all the premiums have to be loaded up front before they vacate absolutely so it's not like you can buy a land and build slowly and give the premiums later got so it so my next question is slightly off the market it's more towards the legal thing so i would request mr ramani to answer this uh, are there any state government policies or any special act for governing the redevelopment projects no uh, can we take up the other two the bow burning you remember we discussed yesterday yeah. you know the hardship and that uh, revenue and of plus, course so yeah that's more burning frankly this we take, take it later better when okay. the money let's talk about the money is coming in got it got that's it. more important so uh, yeah so that is uh, whether the hardship comp hardship compensation and the rental compensation are taxable in the hands of members of housing society so ma many a times we have seen uh, uh, huge safeguard money has been deposited by the developer uh, and at times there is uncertainty of uh, deliverables or it gets delayed or extended okay. so wanted to know that this kind of rental compensation and hardship compensation are taxable or not okay so for those who are studious type i was the one who sometimes comes first in a class or something so i should take notes for those who want to take notes i have done the special arrangement i will spell it out what section what wonderful ITA number everything because i asked here are you happy getting everything so some people said yes because there are some type who would like to get to the last word so i'm speak, speaking out for them there was a case in itat which it is ita number 3526 M two zero one seven for assessment year ten eleven, as well as there's another case which says is for Ajay Paras Parasmal Khotari ITA number two eight two three. This is for assessment year thirteen fourteen, which we say the period is got over on thirteen March thirteen. So I'll just read out one small four lines out of the judgment, which says which says a lot about the transit rent, and it says really well. It says as per paragraph. of uh, dalaraj raj mansukhani it 32 3526 it says in a there is a displacement in a da and that is not a revenue receipt but a capital receipt so that is the first limb of the whole thing now go to the next one it says this is paid due to the hardship faced by the owner of the flat due to this displacement of all the occupants clear now let's go on to having said that there are two itat judgment mumbai let's understand that is on the question of uh, tds on transit rent there is another thing happened very recently this is done this case was argued by somebody from our office mr anuj krishnadwala where the again i'll talk about citations this is for people who don't want to go back to the chartered account and discuss yes. on the dot don't say mr ramani said so i don't go say i say this is where it is that's better than better than that right so i say that there is a case of viren washi versus ito 1633 the date of the order also tell you pronouncement 22nd 72024 i am going that recent okay 
So there, I am telling the judges names also. Narendra Bilaya, judicial member. Rahul Chaudhary, accountant member. There what happened? On the basis of what was uh, done in that earlier case, there was a writ petition filed. That, that's interesting. So that order came in on 15th of uh, April 2024, where the question came, let's understand the basics to get what I'm going to say later. So suppose I'm a charitable trust. Right. My income is not taxable. So the question comes here that can I go to the income tax authorities? There's a wing called TDS wing. I think by now everybody knows that. <coughs> so, so in the TDS wing, so suppose your income is exempt. You, put a, you have to put an application that I am a charitable trust. Please give me an order, a certificate saying that as and when I get my income from in this case, suppose the hospital, then the TPA will pay money to them. So the TPA when he pays the money, he'll get a specific order to his name saying that this X amount of money which you pay to this charitable institution because his income is exempt, you don't deduct any tax. So that concept I believe a lot of people may be knowing but I said for the benefit of others who don't know why I'm saying that there's a reason because this judgment of Bombay High Court is dwelling upon something relating to TDS. Okay. But while okay. dealing with TDS, it is explaining you the whole concept of hardship and all the things. Right? Right, right. So sometimes when you get something as valuable as this from Bombay High Court, what will somebody like me do? Obviously, I put it in the forefront because that goes in your favor. Right. right. So I won't spell it out what happens there. So there, they have clearly said that if there is no taxable income, say in transit rent and all these things, so then no TDS implication. Obviously, okay. the one I, how I give example in a charitable trust, the same logic goes here. So there they have said, again similar lines, which was on this basis, uh, the lawyer from our office got help on talking about his case because there was something to back him on. Correct? Correct. Now what did they say there? That's important. They say transit rent is not considered a revenue receipt and is not liable to tax. As a result of this, there is no question of TDS, uh, deduction of TDS from the amount payable by the developer to the tenant. This is that clear. So when you have judgments like these, you can take somewhat, you can take decisions. Oh, that's great. That's great. And thanks for giving us the specifics with case Thank laws. You. It's amazing. Uh, many a times, gentlemen, we have seen uh, in Mumbai, the development is very scattered. Uh, we see one redevelopment building, then we see a large layout, then again we see one redevelopment building. So I want to break Mr. Nagar's silence now and I want to ask one question that how will the redevelopment project enhance the surrounding community or the neighborhood? I have been waiting uh, just to give you a little background. I come, I'm not original Bombayite. I come from Delhi. And so when you see Delhi, you see lots of nice open Correct. roads and you see this and you come to Bombay and you see this high rise which comes to the point he was telling that why other cities are not getting redeveloped. Delhi has a height cap. Subsequent governments okay. gave an, um, a mandate saying that the ground plus two can become ground plus three. So that becomes the only redevelopment which happens in Delhi. You greater class will become three will become four so they get additional flat right. and this thing. And there is to be a concept called builder flats also which means that the original bungalow could be broken down and then you could build builder flats. So it became three floors of builder flats and that, that is how the development happened in Delhi. But Delhi had the uh, advantage of the fact that surrounding Noida and Gurgaon, most of the DLF and everything else, that there's sufficient land around it which people could migrate. It was 20 minutes away for them, so it was easy for them to, instead of building in GK, they could move down 20 minutes down and stay in a bigger apartment. Right. So those developments happened something around if I context of Delhi, something Noida was about 1500 acres, Gurgaon we built about 1500 acres. So 3000 acres of land Delhi had, or right. for that matter Bangalore had, so everybody else. So they didn't have the same challenges as Bombay had. Bombay has historically been a housing society, multi-storied living concept from day one, from the 40s onwards. And then the rent control came into play, so naturally rents got frozen and everybody lived with this thing and there was no incentive for a owner to spend more money on the building. So naturally building started decaying and the result is that today we have a whole lot of decayed buildings which now thanks to the new policies are getting redeveloped. Right. Which is how it is happening. So because of that there's two things which is happening which I understand that moment you have any redevelopment or anything which is redone, first and foremost because of the setbacks and everything, the road started getting wider. So if in, in a particular street, 
unfortunately not all the buildings in the street get redeveloped. So you got pockets of places where you got larger widths of road and then pockets where the boundary wall is still the narrow road remains. Correct. But the ultimate intention would be that if everything happens, which is why I am more excited about the cluster redevelopment than individual building redevelopment. So when you have a cluster, like we are doing a couple of societies in Malad, where thankfully six societies came together and they got access from the first road also and the back road also, so, so then everybody gets to benefit. Right. So that is excellent model which I say should be encouraged more than single building uh, plots which are generally the trend right now. But if today all of us come together and start making good buildings in every location, then I think overall the city will live up to the price at which it is getting sold. Today right. you are paying a huge amount of money for a property or a product which is, you are comparing yourself to a price which you are actually playing for a New York or a San Francisco apartment or for example a Vancouver apartment. But try to see what a Vancouver apartment gives you for that money versus what you get for Bombay for the value. So in that situation, if, if everybody comes together and thankfully the, the quality of developers who have now taken up redevelopment is of the topmost, uh, you know, criteria. And then the, and the product is coming, what he said, that product is started speaking. So now if everybody starts doing it, we hopefully in 10 years from now, we will have a far better city. Great. Uh, I think two takeaways from your conversation, Mr. Nagar. One is obviously you made a statement called cluster redevelopment. I think that's very exciting in coming near future. Uh, I think there would be more room for innovation, more creativity for developers and that's the future. And the second one which you mentioned definitely uh, all kind of developers getting into redevelopment uh, is something way to see. I mean because uh, initial days it was few years back it was play for few micro market leaders. But now you see every, in fact from other cities people entering into different uh, zones and different micro markets. So I think we'll have to wait and watch for that. Uh, my next question to Harshul would be what are the key legal considerations involved in the redevelopment process such as zoning, regulations, permits and compliance with building codes? So I think uh, two most critical aspects in any redevelopment that uh, any stakeholder should look at is the DP plan, DP remark. I think a lot lies over there, a lot of stories over there. Okay. S right from CRZ, heritage, height restrictions, road widening, reservations, designations. I mean all the kind of issues that can probably come up, uh, all those are pointed out in the DP plan, DP remark. It's available at the BMC website for a meager cost of 4,000 rupees. I think that's the single most important document one should first look at. The second piece is the PR card. That also puts out a lot of story. It's a leasehold land, a freehold land, what kind of lease it is, 30 year lease, perpetual lease. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, information that you can get. I think the mistake that most people do or stakeholders do is they don't look at these two documents. They straight away jump to vicinity, prices, FSI, square foot, make an Excel model, spreadsheet, right. talk of profitability. But whether the building is consuming the FSI, whether it's developing well, etc., this lies over there. And I think lastly, National Building Code, of course, is in play. Uh, your DCR more or less adapts from those building codes. Uh, in Bombay, Mumbai, you have certain restrictions because of which you can't implement, so they are called concessions. And these are concessions which are discretionary but mostly given uh, in cases of redevelopment, especially standalone buildings uh, where there is a genuine constraint. So I think a sum of all of these would constitute about uh, the permits that you should really look at. Okay. So this one is my personal favorite and I would like to shoot, uh, shoot this to Mr. Raija, Ram Raija. Uh, are we correct in assuming that upcoming developers are primarily executing redevelopment projects while larger developers are not involved or is this dynamic changing over a period of time? The dynamic has changed. Is it so? <coughs> it has changed, definitely. As you… Uh, originally, yes. Uh, there were very few uh, A-listed, if you can call them, uh, developers in the redevelopment space. Um, but in the last… Uh, four to five years post-COVID, 
uh, I think most of the uh, large players have entered redevelopment and are pitching um, <clears throat> through most micro markets. Um, as Sir said, cluster is a reality. Um, most listed developers either want an A plus location or must be a cluster and a sizable project. Um, so any project which is of a certain size, the minute a tender is floated, the kind of requirements that the PMC only puts out yeah. throws away 90% of developers that can even bid for it. Because there's a certain net worth, there's a certain amount of balance sheet that requires to be put up there. Because um, people have realized and become smarter that they don't want to play around with their house. Right. Right. So, um, <clears throat> there's a short listing which is pre-done within the tender phase itself. So, there's huge filtration in that. Huge filtration. Huge filtration. Very few developers can actually even bid for some of those sites. So, do we envisage that even this space which is currently dominated by uh, upcoming developers who are the micro-market leaders uh, might see healthy competition from the larger ones because the societies are getting into more compliances, uh, the demands are going to be very high for them. So, do you feel there is a threat or a possibility where uh, the larger developers would take over even the redevelopment play? I don't think so personally because there is enough juice and there are enough number and type of projects in every micro market of Bombay. Yes. For example, as I said, the filtration happens and some bidders can't bid. Similarly, there are some projects that the listed developers won't be interested in only because either it's too small or the juice is not worth the squeeze. Um, there are a lot of uh, scope, for, there's, there's enough room for everyone. Okay. Uh, in every micro market, right? So the developers who are uh, concentrated and market leaders in a certain area will, and there's there's enough uh, demand, there's enough supply. As as I said, even projects that are not feasible, there are builders coming from outside and taking which just want to do it for the name. Absolutely. <laughs> so there's, there's always enough. there's enough room for okay. everyone to coexist. Okay. Um, of course, there is a stark difference yeah. in every area, in a certain area that we focus in. Within Carbandra Santa Cruz itself, there are flats that sell between 40,000 go all the way up to 1,50,000. Right. Within one kilometer radius, right? Correct. Uh, within one kilometer radius, we there are projects that go from 40 all the way to 150. Wow. So, uh, project to project, lane to lane, location to location, developer to developer, there's a difference and there's a buyer. Great. Uh, we have been hearing a lot of things about fintech and prop tech and uh, this question is to Mr. Nagar uh, that the prop tech when we talk about it's complete integration of the sales process as of now. So right from CRM, lead generation, customer management but very hardly we have seen the prop side getting used, I mean the technology being used on the design stages. So my question is how is the technology being integrated into the architectural design to enhance user experience and improve operational efficiency? You are absolutely right. The, uh, the thing I remember when we when 2098 or something when AutoCAD came into uh, right. the thing we used to draw by hand and one day we realized that a computer can do the same thing. Otherwise, I remember spending nights just copying the lower floor plan and the upper floor plan and keep on just copying because everything you have to draft on your own. Now, computer does copy, paste, copy, paste, the fatafat right. it came. Right. Right. So, that was, that was 20 years ago, let's say now. Now, we have got so much software which unfortunately is not being used so much, frankly. But there are softwares right now, AI of course, everybody's heard of, but I'm talking about softwares which can, if you program it, you can generate floor plans. So it's like saying that you put in the maths and you get a result out. It doesn't have uh, this thing. And there is software which will now, some, some of the larger developers are wanting to go into technology and to the concepts of which was originally 2D, 2D became 3D, 3D became 4D, now it's become 5D and now it's come, people are talking about 6Ds, which means that there are six dimensions of construction which includes the drawing, the estimation, the timelines, the construction, the methodology, everything can be now be generated on, on the computer and you can frankly see it on day one and it can happen. But it's not backward integrated into the procurement systems, right. which is what 
ultimate aim of all technology would be that if you put in something here and your procurement systems come in, people can quote on that job correctly, everything gets integrated. It is going there, it is not yet reached that level yet, but uh, it is possible to do it and it is, unfortunately the industry is quite fragmented, right. if you ask that uh, uh, whether it is developers, whether it is product manufacturers or uh, architects or anything, it's not so cohesive. There are some players who have been trying to get us all together to create a one common platform for purchase, for delivery because sometimes you need, sometimes, for example, now we are also exploring the idea of steel. The, what was not there now in the steel development, steel is the most underused Correct. construction system, frankly, if you ask me. In a very tight site, steel makes better sense to, in terms of going into the narrow lane and to prefabricate and make a building happen in a small plot. But it doesn't happen because the, the prefabrication industry works on scale and for them, a single building in middle of Kharthanda is doesn't make sense. Correct. So, Correct. they're very happy. For example, we are building something like 60,000 houses in New Bombay. Their prefab is being used scale because we have set up plants which are 200 crore worth and they are, and we've finished one building in, a 14 story building in 90 days. Okay. So, uh, so that kind of technology exists, but now it's a matter of making sure that that technology reaches your, uh, the, the smaller plots and able to do it. There is one example which is happening in Andheri where a prefab is happening on a, in a very small flat uh, plot. Uh, but he's having his own challenges. Trying to take a six meter trailer into a lane, you have to stop, you have to t inform traffic guys much in advance so that Correct. the trailer start going in. So if, while you have produced it in a prefab, in an industrial setup, but it has to reach the site is a bit of a challenge still here. So that way, that, that technology versus reality, there's a little bit of gap, but it is getting wow. there. 14 stories in 90 days, that's something way to go. Yeah, so again coming back to uh, Mr. Ramani, uh, uh, this is the question which will benefit the universe. Uh, please suggest clauses to be incorporated in the development agreement for the safeguard uh, and the, for, the safe, for safeguarding the timely completion of the project. Okay, so I'm going to deal with, uh, there could be many things because I think uh, Indian brain is very fertile, first of all I would say. We are perhaps, as I seen, we are leaders and so many multinationals, we have Indian brains, they are very good at thinking, right? So, so four things I am going to deal with. A, I would call their head, security premises. B, I would call it bank guarantee. C, I will call it liquidate damages. D, I will call it step in rights. So I am going to deal with each one of them, one by one. So, let us understand why this is. Obviously, who doesn't want uh, a secured life? everybody wants. I would go and say it lightly, I don't know how far you take it. It's like you want, once a redevelopment start, you want it to work. It's right. like marriage, you want to make it work anyhow. So, if it is that important it has to work, there are certain things you ought to do it, right? Okay. So, coming back to where I started. The concept of uh, security premises while redevelopment is to ensure that when a developer is unable to develop the project as per agreed time, the society can take steps to sell the security premises and utilize the fund to complete and continue the project. Okay. Get it? Now I go on to the B part of my uh, bank guarantee. Bank guarantee is a financial instrument, is used to secure a builder's performance and commitment. A bank guarantee, what it is in simple words, it's a promise made by a bank on behalf of a builder to help complete the project which acts as a safety net. Mind you, the word is very important, safety okay. net for the society to ensure that they'll receive compensation, get support when it required if the builder defaults on the contractual obligations. Okay. Now, let's go on to the other two. I talked about liquidated damages, third. These are predetermined amounts agreed to be paid in a contract that a party will pay if they fail to meet a specific obligation, which is of course related to timelines. Everything is timelines. Ram is there and I'm very happy he delivers always. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we liquidate it. Time. It, just, it serves, now this is important, it serves as a financial penalty. 
for delays in project completion or failure to meet agreed upon timelines. Okay. Right? I've tried to keep the language very simple because everybody should understand in one go. So now let's go on to the last one, important. I call it step in rights. Now these means, these rights are such which allows a third party to step in the shoes of the developer if the developer fails to meet its obligations. What's the purpose of this? The purpose of this is that it protects the interests of the society if the developer fails to perform his part. This step in right in short is to mitigate the risk and ensure the project progress as originally planned. Okay. okay. So you get what you want. Okay. That was the intention. That's how these four clauses normally comes in. Uh, one more thing, if with your permission, uh, please. Because when I was discussing the last question, I realized that one important observation of Supreme Court. You know, we love quoting the Supreme Court. So, uh, <laughs> Supreme Court. It is very important because I had a, uh, you know, the benefit once. Uh, the last originally when the redevelopment started, right. I had the benefit of meeting Mr. Chidambaran because I had done something good for the department, the tax department. So there I told him that, you know, your laws are not certain when redevelopment first started. He said it affects only, you know, small or few places in India. So I will see as and when I will think of making the laws, I will make it. We are still not certain. Huh? We are still not certain. We are still not certain. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my grievance to him. He said, Mr. Ramani, we will deal with it. But now it affects only Bombay. That's why I worried. I was going to tell him, Bombay means so much litigation crores. And after that, the amount of litigation, in fact, the maximum litigation is on this topic, even in ITAD or anywhere else, right? Correct. So let's go further on this. So in a famous case of Supreme Court uh, of South Indian Bank Limited versus CIT in the year 2021, 130 taxmen, 178 stroke 283. It has said something very important for us as a country. We need to learn from this. It says that it talks about certainty in tax. That's what he's saying is yet missing. So at para 29 of the judgment, of this judgment, it says, it quotes a gentleman called by the name Adam Smith in his book, Wealth of Nations, book number 5, chapter number 2. It says that tax, which is very important, huh? now comes the main punchline. Right. The tax which each individual is bound to pay ought to be certain and not arbitrary. Hmm? The time of payment, the manner of payment, the quantity to be paid, all ought to be clear and, and plain to the contributor and to every other person. Okay. Frankly, when I was coming here today morning, when I saw this, it just somehow came in my, you know, I was doing some work on this. I felt if we go close to this, believe me, redevelopment will be such a, it's a breeze. Because of lack of certainty on so many counts, we get in trouble. In of course, yes. If certainty were to be there, we would have been somewhere else. Great points. Thank you. Great points. Uh, last two questions for the session. Uh, Mr. Nagar, this question is for you. Uh, many a times we have seen the redevelopment projects are compromised on the design bit because there is some portion of handover to be given to the old tenants in the building because of which the designing becomes a constraint on the uh, sale component. So my question to you is what are the challenges, typical challenges or constraints related to architectural design for a redevelopment project? You are right. The, uh the member, the existing member versus what you want to uh, there and develop, the sizes vary, the, the idea of what you want to give changes and naturally that kind of affects the, the structural grid of the building, affects the what you come and to some extent I would say that our bylaws are, are a uh, big question mark and that definitely doesn't address in any way the needs of the society. Hafiz has been fighting for it almost every month I know he goes to Urban Development Ministry to fight the case for all the developers. To It of course resulted in because of the fair amount of excesses that used to happen and that was put a stop to and it was put a stop to with so much stop that 
created, it killed all creativity for whatever reason it did and now slowly some concessions have come in, slowly some things are coming in, so you could see, otherwise the buildings, office building and residential building was all looking same. Correct. To some extent, the, the flatness of the whole, um, the, the way the buildings were built. But coming to your challenges, uh, it is, while it looks challenging, it is really speaking not because uh, tenants or the current members are also requiring besides the fact that they, want, they are getting certain free, let's say 35%, 40%, 50%, whatever is the developer. Right. But when you speak to them, you realize that they are also wanting to have a better space. Yeah, yeah. Correct. Right. So it is just not that first is the greed, of course, everybody has the greed. The developer has a greed, that the member has a greed that I want the maximum that I can do. But when you, when you attend some of those meetings with them, they realize that they are also looking for a good space. They might have a, today, a, let's say a small um, 1 BHK or 350, 450 square feet. Right. But the aspiration is not 450, the aspiration is still 1200 square feet, the aspiration is still 1800 square feet. Why would you want to stay in a uh, 1200 square feet 3 bedroom and you know 1500 3 bedroom will be better space. So they need, so there is sometimes you explain to them that if you come halfway and we come this thing, can you do it? So they have, I have seen occasions where the tenants have said, okay, we will buy the extra space. Right, right. When, it, when they do that, then the building starts becoming better because then you don't have too many of those offsets, too many of those things happening. But this is only in the case of very small plots where the tenant and the new sale has to happen in the same building. Correct. But generally, so far, thankfully, the projects that I have handled have had two separate buildings and there are slightly larger plots which I could accommodate two of them separately, so there isn't that challenge. But within the tenant building, of course, there are challenges because there is a 370 square feet flat, there is a 460 square feet flat, there is a 480 square feet flat, there is a ridiculous amount of variations which are there. We tried to rationalize them uh, to the extent that in one project we had about 70 variations, but with discussions we brought it down to about 20, 22 odd and they also agreed that we'll pay, developer agreed to give that extra space. So that way you kind of come across to make projects happen. Okay, okay. So uh, uh, I would, I mean there have been a lot of challenges for development from the developer's perspective. So I would request Harshul to right from acquisition of a project till the execution of the project, I would request you to mention three main ch challenges which you as a developer is facing and how do you address this? So, you know, I'll put it out in three phases, acquisition, execution and completion, you know, principally. While acquiring, I think the title right. and the people who constitute the redevelopment are the biggest challenge. Because, you know, you have certain garages which are misused as shops, you have people using terrace flats, you have people who've enclosed balconies, people who've enclosed otlas and now they're claiming extra space on area which is beyond uh, legal carpet. So, you know, right. people themselves are the biggest roadblock over there. So, dealing with them uh, is one piece. Execution, I think principally financial closure has become the most critical part. Okay. Earlier, you know, you had the NBFC cultures and we had the finance session prior to this. Uh, you know, you would have uh, slightly more expensive capital, but they were at least funding your premiums. Premiums today constitute 30% of your project cost. Right. Now, given the way RBI is tightening it out, given the way RERA is playing it out, uh, if someone doesn't have capital enough to cover for approvals, and the initial cost, which is, by the way, 40% to 50% of the project cost, uh, then the only respite is AIF. And AIF are the Pathans. Uh, you know, they charge north of 18%, 20%, so it's not viable at all. So given that financial closure, someone who has the initial equity uh, should only look at the project. Otherwise, uh, a redevelopment also today requires a lot of uh, capital, you know, almost 40% of the project cost. Lastly, in terms of completion, I think the most important part is the experience that one gives to the customers. I think they are the future brand managers, they are the future brand that you intend to carry forward and I think the experience that you give to them after you've sold the flat, I think is the single most 
uh, important challenge which I think most of us from the fraternity need to look at. Great points, Harshul. With that, I think we are towards the end of the session. Uh, just to conclude, we discussed a lot of things from the design perspective, from price trends, the future of uh, redevelopment. Thanks to all the panelists and for their great views. Appreciate. Uh, I don't know, are we left with two minutes for FAQs or you want to wind up right now? We can take uh, one question. Uh. Uh, my question will be particularly to Mr. Harshul. We are effectively looking at doubling of FSI, every building coming up and all. Since you are looking after the statistics and research at uh, Kredai, can you please tell me the number of schools and hospitals which will be needed for in Bombay coming up simultaneously to take care of this bloated population? So I think unfortunately Mumbai is land starved. Uh, you know, the, whatever the town planning was made and whatever land was allocated for social infrastructure today, the only way we can suffice and you know recently there was a judgment where Hospitals were allowed to increase their height from 30 meters to 45 meters. So the only way really uh, to go forward in increasing the social infrastructure, which is your schools, your hospitals and you know the other ancillaries is going vertical. I think the FSI for those also need to increase. There is no possibility of allocating more space because these as an asset class don't really attract the capital. Uh, and ultimately for any landowner, it is the land use that he will look at. So if he has an option to do residential vis-a-vis uh, -vis any of these alternate real estate, I think Mumbai clearly gives the answer 95% of the land use is going towards residential. Going vertical. I think that's the only way. I think way. we'll see hospitals also being 30 stories now. <laughs> that's the way it has to look like, otherwise it, it's not sustainable. Thank you so much. Uh, any more everyone. questions, of course, we can connect uh, offline in the best interest of time. Please give them a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Uh